Yes, I'm French, therefore, ah, yes. Therefore, I can speak without the mask. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and I'm used to speak seated. Uh, that uh, being standing there gives me the vertigo. Uh, so I think that uh, I'm a friend of Jeff. And we became friends when I heard him uh, by chance. I had a friend called Elihu Katz who took me to a lecture. He told me there's a great guy who's speaking. You should not miss this. So I, fo I, I followed uh, my friend and I saw Jeff and he was speaking of three things which I found fascinating. He was speaking of Michel Foucault versus Hannah Arendt. And, I described, and he was describing how Hannah Arendt had anticipated and rejected many of the theses of Foucault, which was delightful to me. Then he was speaking of Irving Goffman, who was one of my masters, and who I believe is the greatest theorist of cinema, uh, and who was, by the way, a cinema person before being a sociologist. So I think that uh, I asked a question, and Jeff told me, ah, I know this voice. This must be Daniel Dayan. We didn't know each other. And so uh, in a way, some, something clicked immediately. And I think that like many of those people who will speak today, I am uh, someone who has been immensely influenced by the politics of small things. And my paper today, is about, uh, thank you, thank you, it's very nice. So I've been telling all these stories for nothing, but anyway, my uh, paper, uh, do you hear me? Yeah. Uh, is about uh, an issue which is very dear to me, is uh, first it's the issue of gestures. Uh, you know, when people meet around the kitchen table, they are gesturing, they are pretending, they are organizing themselves as if this was the public sphere. And this as ifness to me is immensely important. So I'm interested in gestures in two ways. Uh, first, I believe that doing as if is doing. And uh, in a way, this is uh, you know, my Austinian take on Jeff's uh, analysis. In the same way, uh, you can uh, doing as if for not doing anything. And this is the ambiguity of gestures. Gestures both allow you to pretend to act and to justify that you do not act. So this is my first theme. The theme will be running throughout my paper. The second theme has to do with victimism. Victimism is some sort of um, ideology that brings together a number of groups that are very heterogeneous. Some of them are sub-imperialisms, uh, you know, former colonized countries that uh, use this occasion as a possibility for vindication or revenge. And some of them are social movements within Western countries. And you have, uh, we attend an unexpected alliance between these two groups, and this alliance is made possible by an ideology, which is the ideology of victimism or the cult of victims. I think that uh, the big issue concerning uh, the victims uh, and victimism is the issue of the cult of the other. But it is quite interesting to find who is the other, and who defines the other, and how extended is the definition of the other? Is victimism really uh, the respect of all others, or is victimism a specialized enterprise that validates certain others? And this is a question that uh, I'm asking. I think that's, uh, to summarize my question, I would say the other has another, and this other is not me. Or is not, it could be me, but it is not always me, okay? And some people have the hubris or pretension to believe they are the only possible other of the other, okay? And I think that if you are moving from Levinasian heights to sociology, you have to recognize that others come in the plural. 
there's no the other. There are others, and these others do not like each other necessarily. It is not because I love them out of a Levinasian ambition that they would love each other. So uh, the, in other terms, the imperative of regard presupposes also an imperative of justice. Okay, so this is my introduction. What am I, uh, what am I telling about? I'll try to describe uh, the, the rise of this uh, victimist uh, ideology. I think that the first point is uh, uh, the cult of victims is organized into a concert of gestures. Uh, first point, gestures rarely go one by one. They tend to form clusters to speak to each other and to form dialogues of gestures, or more exactly, if, using, if you use the Latin origin of the word, concerts of gesture. A concert comes from cum certare, means to fight with, okay? So gestures fight other gestures. Uh, I think that the, this text is interested in those victims who, uh, to whom recognition is denied. Uh, the, the cult of victims is meant to offer recognition to all victims, but strangely enough, it doesn't. So how come there are limits to this cult? Uh, I think that uh, the fact of being a victim today confers a status that goes much beyond what Axel Honneth called recognition. Uh, it is somehow the basis of a new legitimacy. And this took, uh, this, there was a turn that occurred, and this turn interests, interests me. It was described by a philosopher friend of mine. Some of you may know her name is Susan Neyman. Uh, she's a philosopher in Berlin, and she has described a certain uh, dilemma. This dilemma was exemplified by the state of Israel. At one moment, the state of Israel considered the possibility of creating a day for the celebration of Shoah. But the Israelis decided not to. They didn't want to celebrate something which was a case of victimhood. Uh, the, the problem was that it, Israel was still within a certain paradigm which has disappeared since, and it was the paradigm of the hero. So how can you, when you are in the paradigm of a hero, celebrate something which is merely a victim? Why should you celebrate passiveness? Okay, so there was a big debate in Israel, and finally they found a solution. Uh, the Shoah would be celebrated, there would be a day which exists to this day, and which I think occurred yesterday, or the day before. It's called Yom HaShoah, the day of Shoah. But it was rebaptized. We know the beginning of the name. We don't know the end of the name. It is called Yom HaShoah Vehagvura, which means the day of the Shoah and of heroism. So in a way, this, this was some sort of a middle way solution, which allowed to accept victimism without renouncing to the ideal of activity versus passiveness. I think that uh, Susan Neyman asks, uh, it is strange to see victimism becoming uh, uh, this generalized ideology. Can passiveness serve as a model? What sort of model would it give? And Susan Neyman asks, what is a civilization that gives itself as a model the position of the victim? Uh, don't, is it sufficient? Don't you need something else? Uh, in the same way, it is interesting that victimism usually is presented as a discourse of progressism. But is progressism turns towards the past? Okay, uh, you have a strange orientation, your strange bifurcation in time. How can you be both looking forward and backward? Okay, so you have a number of uh, problems and those problems have to do with my first, now uh, I'll come to a definition. That definition, uh, that's a heart, one of the hearts, I, I have, I tend to write papers with many hearts. Uh, uh, one of my hearts then is the distinction between victimhood 
and victimism. Victim, victimhood is a fact. You know, someone did to something to you. Victimism is an ideology. The two are connected, but they are not indissociably connected. In his book uh, called Distant Suffering, my friend uh, Luc Boltanski has given us a cast of victimhood. If you look at victimhood, you have a victim, you have a perpetrator, and you have a third character, which is quite interesting. And this third character is the Good Samaritan, the person who comes to the rescue of the victim. And uh, so you have this first cast. Now I'm transforming the thesis of uh, Boltanski by adding that if you move to victimism, you have another cast. Somehow the first cast is present, but there's another cast that has superseded the first. And this cast is made of uh, the hair or spokesperson of the victim and the hair or uh, forced to be hair of the perpetrator. So when you move from victimhood to victimism, you move into a dialogue where the actors of the original event have been expelled or died and have been replaced by their spokesperson. And I think that this is some sort of a meta dialogue. And this is about this meta dialogue that Boltanski makes reference to Hannah Arendt's difference between pity and compassion. Compassion is direct. Compassion is a relationship of a body to another body. Pity is mediated. And in a way, you could say that pity is suffering from all the ills that Rousseau has described about mediated realities. Pity can somehow take your compassion and take it wherever it wishes to take it. So when you move into pity, you become prey of this course. I think that, uh, what are the actions of victimism? I think that the first action is, of course, speaking in the name of the victim. And I am reminded here of the exercise that took place in uh, ancient Greece, where there were a, a corporation of, um, how do you say, priestesses that were called pities. I don't know whether you pronounce pities in, in, in English. And pities were somehow uh, inspired by uh, the gods, were able to produce strange screams. But at the door of the pities uh, places, there, were, there was another corporation of people called prophets. The prophets has, had a job. It was to translate the work of the pities. I'm told I have two minutes. <laughs> so uh, I think that uh, I uh, uh, <clears throat> try to jump to some conclu conclusion. And I think that perhaps my main point uh, is the one which ties me to Jeff. And my main point is that uh, I, I, in the rest of my paper, I describe the extraordinary success in, of victimism in replacing the paradigm of heroism. At one moment, heroism is over, victimism takes over. And I think that uh, what strikes me is, how was it possible? How did people do that? And, uh, and what strikes me is that they, do, they did it without the hands. My metaphor to describe this phenomenon is the walls of Jericho. There was at moment, well, at the, there was a time where Jericho was besieged, and uh, there were all sorts of weapons used to destroy the walls of Jericho. Then came a group of soldiers equipped with trumpets, and they produced a few notes of music. And responding to these few notes of music, the walls of Jericho collapsed. They genuflexed. They opened themselves to the enemy. So the question is, how is it possible to transform history just with a few notes of music? And I think that what strikes me about victimism today, or in its version that is a version in our countries, is that essentially the action of victimism is made of gestures. 
It is through gestures that uh, the situation is transformed. It is through gestures that victimism has succeeded in replacing uh, uh, the former paradigm. So I think that my question is, how could it be possible? And this speaks of the power of a certain sort of small things, which I call gestures. My uh, conclusion was to try to analyze what sorts of gestures. And obviously, within victimism, there are echoes of a discussion that took place yesterday. I mean, victimism is supposed to be about compassion. When you look at the nature of gestures through which it produces itself, you discover that compassion plays a lesser role than rage or resentment. Compassion is the opening of the victimism, like you have an opening of the melody. Then comes the symphony itself. And the symphony itself is about resentment, is about rage, it's about destruction. And it is interesting to see how something that is so loaded with negative feelings as is able to present itself with this charming, uh, compassionate approach. So what I'm trying to describe here is both a paradox, you know, how it is that victimism is not what it seems, and how is it that this, whatever it, it has, has benefited from the enormous power of gestures. Thank you. Thank you.